When it comes to political or historical maps, you have two main choices on how to display information on who controls what land. You could choose a de facto map, which is basically an honest map that shows the reality on the ground in terms of who controls what. Or you could choose a de jure map, which means you map things according to a legal standard. Nowadays, de jure control would apply to international treaties being enforced as well as international recognition by the United Nations. An obvious example is Crimea. After Russia took Crimea in 2014, a de facto map would show Russia possessing Crimea, because whether you liked it or not, they were there. A de jure map, though, would say that since their occupation was illegal, they would still map Crimea as Ukrainian. Some maps may add a note or a dotted line border to indicate a dispute of some kind, but ultimately they're choosing de jure or de facto. But sometimes de jure can get complicated. For something like Kosovo, Serbia would view Kosovo as legally theirs, but other nations would legally view Kosovo as independent. So you get some contradictory de jure maps. While I could get into a tangent on why this proves de facto maps are almost always better, I'll instead talk about how when you look at early colonial times, maps get absolutely insane. Each country has their own perspective on what a de jure map is. So let's talk about how absolutely insane colonial maps are. So for the Americas during the early colonial period, every country tried to claim as much as it could. Since they tended to ignore the indigenous population altogether, they tended to do this thing where they claimed huge stretches of land even if they didn't control anything aside from a few forts or towns. After all, they also literally viewed their colonies as their god-given right. However, multiple monarchs claiming to claim things as their god-given right led to many disputes and overlapping claims. In 1498, Spain and Portugal made a jump start with the Treaty of Tordesillas. In that treaty, they got the Pope's approval to divide the Americas solely amongst themselves. Thanks to errors in early cartography and a lack of knowledge on what the Americas looked like, Portugal got shafted. But according to this treaty, this is what the Americas looked like according to Papal, Spanish, and Portuguese law in 1498. This was before Spain and Portugal even had colonies on the mainland. But nevertheless, this is how insane de jure colonial maps got, claiming entire continents ahead of time. Eventually, even Spain and Portugal realized this was absurd, and they didn't even follow their own treaty, and they ended up overlapping their demarked line quite a bit. So they signed the Treaty of Madrid in 1750 to recognize something a little bit closer to reality. Well, still ignoring the indigenous groups, but closer nonetheless. If you want to be technical though, for 252 years, a map of the Americas from a de jure Spanish perspective would have been this. Weird, isn't it? Naturally, the other colonial powers didn't bother to agree to this treaty either. England was slightly more humble than Spain and didn't claim an entire continent, but they established colonial charters with ridiculous claims thanks to simple but precise language. Since they didn't know how far westwards North America extended at this time, they admittedly didn't quite understand the magnitude of their claims, but nevertheless, if you go by their legal documents, then you get some truly ridiculous colonial claims. The Virginia Company of London, when getting a second charter in 1609, the Virginia Company of London, when getting their second charter in 1609, established straight line boundaries as the limits of their claim, but it claimed that those boundaries extended, quote, from sea to sea, basically meaning from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So a de jure map of Colonial Virginia in 1609 looks like this. Yeah, and this was when they only had Jamestown. For the Plymouth Council of New England, they were also granted a sea to sea charter, but this overlapped with Virginia's charter. Now, as time went on, charters would sometimes be replaced with others, so a de jure map of North America, according to England, would change a lot. But in spite of this, once the United States earned independence in 1783 and possessed land to the Mississippi River, a lot of the individual states claimed land further west based on these old colonial charters, and they had to spend a decade making agreements to finalize what their state borders would end up being. Plus, once again, this is all still ignoring the reality of the multiple indigenous claims, which make things even more complicated. France, on the other hand, when they established their Louisiana colony, made the claim based on the Mississippi Watershed Basin, which means if you include French-Canadian claims, a de jure map of North America according to France would be this. Naturally, all of these overlapping claims would lead to disputes and cause whole wars. Some of you who learned about the French and Indian Wars in school may remember that it started over a dispute in the Ohio Valley, and uh, yeah, their claims definitely overlapped there. 
And as far as they were concerned, there could only be one. And that ended up being Britain, because, you know, they won. With this context on how Europeans claimed land, you can understand how Manifest Destiny arose in the United States and operated the way it did. Manifest Destiny was this idea that the United States was destined to expand its borders across North America. It was their God-given right to rule America, not Europe. Once they reached the Pacific Ocean, it was often quoted from then on that the U.S. was now spread from sea to shining sea. Sound familiar? So ultimately, North America looked different to a lot of people, and most European Day URA maps were absolutely insane. I'm Emperor Tiger Star, and I'll see you guys next time.